Hey everyone, welcome back to Control System Lectures. This is the fourth video on discrete control, and in this video we're going to continue exploring the different techniques we can use to discretize a continuous system. And as we've covered so far, there's a bunch of different ways, and each have their own quirks and benefits. And in this video I want to explain the matched pull zero method. But before I start, I'd like to turn your attention to the Wikipedia page for the matched method and point out something very important. Well, it's not terribly important, but at least it's something I want to share with you before we begin. If you scroll down to the reference section, you can see that Rabiner and Gold state that this ad hoc technique is at best only a stopgap measure, and in general the use of impulse invariant or bilinear transformation is preferred. And then Jackson states, although perfectly usable filters can be designed in this way, no special time or frequency domain properties are preserved, and it's not widely used. Uh, yeah, that sort of takes the momentum from this video. And I said each method has its benefits, and so far the matched method sounds like it only has quirks. And what's the point of learning a method that isn't useful? Well, I have two answers to that. First, this concept just makes a lot of sense, unlike that sentence that I just wrote. But it's honestly something that you might accidentally stumble across and reinvent one day. And because of that, I think it's an interesting method that's fun to learn. And second, I think spending some time to understand this method will help you become more familiar with the z-plane and discretization, which can really only help. So if you stick with me through this video, I think you'll find it worth your while. Okay, recall that when we're discretizing a continuous system, we're trying to find an appropriate mapping between the continuous s-domain and the discrete z-domain. That is, we're looking for the best way to convert our s-domain transfer function into a z-domain transfer function. And in previous videos, we covered several ways to do this mapping. With the impulse invariant method, we used the z-transform to create a discrete system that produces the same impulse response as the continuous system albeit one will be sampled instead of continuous. We also took into consideration the effects the zero-order hold has when discretizing a continuous plant. This is sometimes referred to as the step invariant method because it produces the exact same step response as its continuous counterpart. Now we didn't cover the first order hold method, however it assumes that for the analog to digital converter, rather than holding the last sample constant like it does with a zero-order hold, it instead holds the slope constant and produces a series of ramps rather than steps. Now you can do out the math like we did for the zero order hold method and find the transformation. But this method is also referred to as the ramp invariant method, hopefully for obvious reasons. Now here's the thing. All three of these methods have the exact same claim to fame. They produce discrete systems that behave a specific way in the time domain. That is, they produce an accurate impulse response, an accurate step response, or an accurate ramp response, all time domain responses. However, the matched pole zero method isn't trying to do that. It won't produce a similar time domain response as its S domain counterpart. In fact, it doesn't even produce a similar frequency domain response, which is the whole reason Jackson made that statement in his book. Instead, the matched pole zero method answers the question, what if we just take each pole and zero in the S domain and move them over individually to the corresponding spot in the Z domain? What would we get then? Well, let's find out. The dynamics of a linear time invariant system can be completely defined and understood by knowing the locations of the system's poles and zeros and knowing its DC gain. In the S domain, we know that the transfer function of our system can be, and is often represented as a ratio of two polynomials with the Laplace variable s. Of course, instead of a ratio of two high order polynomials, in this case the numerator is just a constant and the denominator is a second order polynomial, we can rewrite this as the ratio of the product of several first order polynomials plus a multiplier term. This is the zero pole gain, or zpk, form of the transfer function because you can clearly see each of their values. This particular transfer function has no finite zeros, it has poles at minus 1 and minus 2, and it has a multiplier gain of 3. And from this we can easily plot the poles and zeros on the s-plane and see graphically where they lie. And using our understanding of the s-plane we can make claims like if all the poles exist in the left half plane, then the system is stable. Let me stop us real quick and go off on a quick aside. I said that this is the zero pole gain form of the transfer function, 
but don't let this gain value fool you into thinking that this is the DC gain, or the really, really low frequency gain value. It isn't. We can double check that statement by going over to MATLAB and calculating the value of the DC gain. Now the first thing I do is create the Laplace variable s. Now we're not actually going to use this variable, I just created it out of force of habit. We're actually going to use the zpk function to create our transfer function and then check the DC gain of that result. And our system has no finite zeros, so we can just pass in an empty matrix. We have poles at minus 1 and minus 2, and we have a gain of 3. And now we can verify that this is the exact same transfer function that I wrote down earlier, and then calculate the DC gain of this system with the DC gain function. And it claims it's 1.5, not 3 like we specified. They are clearly different. And if we go back to the blackboard, we can find the DC gain of the continuous system by hand simply by setting s to 0 and then simplifying the ratio. And here we get 1.5 like we expected. Setting s to 0 allows us to find that really low frequency gain because s equals sigma plus j omega. And so setting it to 0 is the same as zeroing out the exponential term and then making the frequency omega also 0, so it's just a flat line. Technically, we're looking for the limit as s goes to 0, but just setting it to 0 is close enough. Now, if you wanted to write out your transfer function as a zero-pole DC gain function, then you'd have to make sure that each pole in 0 was written in such a way that they each had a DC gain of 1. Then the multiplier that's left over is the DC gain of the entire system. Okay, hopefully that helped at least a little bit, because we're going to use the DC gain of our system later on in this video. Okay, let's finally get to the actual matched method. Now that we have the location of our S domain poles and zeros, the idea is that we want to move each one over to the Z plane and place them in the corresponding spot. But where to place them? Fortunately, mapping them to the Z domain is pretty straightforward. We just use the definition of the variable Z, which is defined in terms of S, as Z equals E to the S T, where T is the sample time of the discrete system. So let's use this transformation on our two poles for a sample time of one second. For the pole at s equals minus 1, the z location becomes e to the minus 1, or 0 0.3679. And for the pole at s equals minus 2, the z location becomes e to the minus 2, or 0 0.1353. Now we can plot them in the z plane and use them to write out a z domain transfer function g of z. And we're done, right? Well, mapping the poles and zeros over is just the first step in the process. You can see we're clearly not done yet by looking at the Bode plots of our original S domain system and comparing it to the Bode plot of our mapped Z domain system. I do that here in MATLAB by first defining the Z variable for a one second sample time and then defining our transfer function G of Z in terms of that variable. Now we can compare the two Bode plots and see that they look similar but are clearly different. The discrete system has higher overall gain, and the phase falls off much faster. The difference is even more clear by looking at the step response of both. Again, the discrete system has higher overall gain. So what are we missing? Well, we're missing the other three steps in the matched pole zero method. The complete four-step process is this. Step one, map each pole and zero to the z-plane. Done, we did that. Step two, add zeros at infinity if necessary. Okay, that's strange, makes no sense, but we'll do that anyway. Step three, remove zeros at infinity to make a strictly proper function. Well, that's just confusing since we just added some of those, but we'll go along with it. And step four, adjust the gain. Ah, uh, yeah, the DC gain that we talked about before. Each of these new steps will make more sense when we walk through them, so let's do that now. Step two, add zeros at infinity. Now at first glance, it would look like this system has no zeros, right? There's nothing in the numerator that looks like it would be a zero. However, there are zeros there, they're just hidden. Remember that if there are more poles than zeros, like we have, then your transfer function actually has a zero at infinity, with the number of zeros at infinity being the difference of the number of finite poles and finite zeros. Now I think this is easier to comprehend in a root locus plot. Recall that the lines for a root locus plot start at the open loop zeros and travel to the open loop poles. However, in the case where there are more poles than zeros, the extra lines come in from infinity. These are the hidden extra zeros that we need to account for, 
the ones way out at infinity, and in this case, we have two of them. The way we account for them is by shifting them down to the Nyquist frequency, which means putting a zero at z equal minus one for every infinity zero in the s domain. So for us, this transfer function has two zeros at infinity, and therefore our discrete transfer function will include two zeros at z equals minus one. Well, that seems easy enough. So let's move on to step three, create a strictly proper transfer function. Now, while mathematically we can have a transfer function that can have any number of poles and zeros, real life systems can't because real systems are causal. Causal means that the output depends only on the past or current inputs, but not future inputs. Clearly, in real life, you can't respond to something that hasn't happened yet. Now, a causal transfer function is one that has an equal number or fewer zeros than poles. Our system has an equal number, but the convention for the matched pole zero method is to just make it strictly proper, or a transfer function that only has fewer zeros than poles. Therefore, we remove any z equals minus one zeros until the system is strictly proper. Alternatively, we could have only added the zeros at infinity in step two until the order of the numerator was one less than the order of the denominator and combine those two steps into one. But either way would get us to the same spot, which is a strictly proper transfer function in the z domain. Now, if we head back over to MATLAB and create this new transfer function, we can then plot its Bode plot alongside the other two and you can see that it tweaked the shape a little bit. Our phase roll-off isn't quite as severe, and the gain plot matches the roll-off a little better around one radian per second. Not a huge change, but one worth doing. And for the step response, our new function, the yellow line, rises a bit more like the continuous system. However, we've screwed up the gain even more. So let's go fix the gain term in step four. A multiplier is applied to the z domain function to make the dc gain value of both the z and s domain functions the same. I'll add in the multiplier we're looking for in red. This is actually easier to do than you might think. As we learned before, the dc gain for a continuous system is found by setting s to zero, and the dc gain for a discrete system is found by setting z to one. With a little bit of algebra, we find that the multiplier for the z-domain transfer function is 0.4099. I'll just copy our previous transfer function and multiply it by this value. And this is the final form of g of z. This is the result of converting the continuous transfer function using the matched pole zero method. We can double check this by using the continuous to discrete function c to d in MATLAB. Our continuous system we want to convert is g, the sample time of the discrete system is one second, and we want to use the matched pole zero method for the conversion. And you can see that we got the exact same result in MATLAB as we did by hand. And now we can plot the Bode plot for this final version and see just how nicely the two gain plots overlay with each other. We can also plot the step response and see that they're also much closer now than they were before. So those last three steps in the matched method were pretty necessary. Now you may not use this method very much, but I still think it's a pretty cool thing to know. In the next video, I'll cover the more popular and more useful bilinear transform. If you have any questions or comments on this video, please leave them below and I'll try my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, and thanks for watching. And a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters for making this video possible. If you'd like to support me in my efforts on YouTube, you can from the Patreon link in the description below. For any amount of support, you can download a digital copy of my book in progress on control theory. Now, I'm still actively writing the book, so it's not yet complete, but if you'd like a copy of what I have so far, but are unable to support me through Patreon for any reason, just email me at controlsystemlectures at gmail.com, and I'll send you a copy for free. That way we can spread the knowledge and help everyone on their quest to becoming better control system engineers. Thanks, everyone.